the topic, as Matthias said, is on-street parking, and there is a, there are a few themes that I'd like to emphasise as I talk today for about 30 to 40 minutes. One, one of them is the importance of on-street parking management. It's there in the title. I imagine that those of you who have joined already feel that par on-street parking management is important. Maybe you, you're looking for tools to persuade others that it's important. It, it certainly is not easy. It's not to be taken lightly. Some cities think it's important, but they think it's easy. It's not easy, but it's important. It needs to be taken seriously. It's not simple, but it can be improved. So there's a message of hope here, hopefully, that um, things can get better. But certainly there's plenty of uh, images in my slideshow of, of disastrous kind of on-street parking management. I apologize, there's probably more images of, of bad parking management than good parking management in this slideshow. It's not a glamorous topic, but it's very, very important. It's one of those unsexy issues that are the nuts and bolts behind successful cities. And people don't think about it when it's working well, but uh, certainly they, they notice when it's not working well. So the toolkit, which is under review that Matthias mentioned, ha has a number of topics. And it's a rather detailed topic, and it's a rather detailed toolkit. I can't share with you today all of those details or even half of them, but what I will try to do is to give you a sense of the flavor of the toolkit, hopefully whet your appetite, make you curious to, to read more, and, and share with you a few of the key uh, issues. One of the challenges in writing this toolkit is that, is that I've been aim we've been aiming at an international audience, and parking and streets vary so much from country to country, from city to city, and so it's, it's rather difficult to provide detailed guidance. We, 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 we've tried our best to provide guidance that is as detailed as possible and yet still relevant to an international audience. And um, you can see on your screen a list of, of some of the key topics that are in the parking guide. So a key theme to begin with, many cities are embroiled in debates about on-street parking management, and those debates are often driven by the obvious things going on in the streets. Everyone can see chaos in the streets. Unfortunately, if, if the policies are driven by just those casual observations, um, you'll, you'll have a big problem you really need to get some serious parking data in order to, to do wise parking management. So on-street parking casual observations can be very misleading. You can see chaos in the streets and people jump to the conclusion that there is a shortage of parking. That conclusion is very often, in fact I would go so far as to say it's almost always wrong. It's almost always a mistake to jump to the conclusion that parking is, is, is in, in shortage. A careful inventory will often show up that there's more than you thought, more parking than you thought, and an occupancy survey that includes off-street parking will very often reveal that off-street parking is underused, even, as, even at the same time as we see chaos in the streets. So this example from Shenzhen in China, um, in the very same neighborhood, you know, only, only 100 meters apart, chaos in the streets, but underground parking inside buildings, under buildings, that is um, very, very much underused. And that's a very common scenario all over the world and in survey after survey. Even the situation in the streets can be misleading. We tend to focus on the busy places where people want to park and people get very frustrated they can't park exactly where they want to park. But when we do careful surveys, we, we very often find that just around the corner, blocks nearby have uh, plenty of space, plenty of empty spaces. And so careful occupancy surveys reveal these variations in parking occupancy. See, in the streets of cities often varies on a very short, um, a very short uh, scale, a very small scale. By the way, just let me know in the chat if um, anything is not clear or if you can't hear me, 
if, if uh, I've dropped out or anything, maybe I need to repeat something, just let me know, please. Another problem that's invisible unless you do a careful survey is that long duration parking, parking by commuters, parking all day, may be a big part of your problem. Yes, your parking may be full, sometimes the parking is full, but it may be that you want your parking to be full of shoppers, customers, short-term visitors, and in fact it's full of people who are parking all day because they're working in the neighborhood. That situation is difficult to, to judge unless you do a license plate survey that can tell you the duration of the, of the vehicle's parking. And it's, it's, this can be a big problem even if only a few of the vehicles that arrive in a neighborhood are long duration parking. Um, in this example from Indonesia, um, only, only about a quarter of the vehicles arriving in this particular area were parking for more than about two or three hours, taking more than half of the space. So long duration parking can be a big part of your problem and you will only know it if you do a survey. You can't tell just from casual observations. Moving on to another topic, just to um, emphasize that good parking management makes a big difference. I'm not going to give you a lot of data on this. Um, there are lots and lots of studies that demonstrate that good parking management does make a difference. I'll just tr tr try to make the point briefly. Uh, you can certainly see these images of, of poor parking management. Um, it, it's easy to find those. Even in Western cities, we can find lots of examples of that. But when parking management effort is stepped up, um, it usually makes a, a, a big difference. Even when you see enormous amounts of chaos, it, it sometimes seems hopeless. Cities like Beijing or Kiev or Amman sometimes feel hopeless that they, they you know, how, how could we possibly get order in our streets when we see these kind of scenes? But even a modest effort can make a big difference. And in fact, the, the, the early parts of parking management efforts uh, often make the biggest visible difference. Once you've got basic order, you still need to make sure that the parking is not completely full. So parking management is often aimed at making sure there's a few empty spaces on each street so that people can find a place. And parking management tools can achieve that. Uh, the number one tool that does achieve that is pricing, and I'll talk about that um, in a little while. A recent example of this is Shenzhen. So in a comparison between May 2014 and uh, October 2014, Shenzhen saw dramatic improvements in the availability of on-street parking in several districts where they introduced pricing. In fact, they actually overdid it and there were too many empty spaces. They, they, the price was maybe a little too high. They also saw dramatic improvements in illegal parking. It's not completely solved the problem, but it's much, much better than it was before. I'll show you a slide about that a little later. So many kinds of on-street parking management problems, there are on-street parking management tools appropriate for that problem. Slightly different problems are, arise in restaurant districts and sometimes cities sometimes tear their hair out thinking they uh, can't possibly solve these terrible problems. There are tools appropriate to that. One of the most difficult, actually, is competition for parking in residential areas, which is a problem in some cities, in Chinese cities, for example, at the moment, and in Indian cities at the moment. This is a big, a big issue that uh, gets a lot of attention. It is a difficult one, but good, consistent parking management efforts can address that problem as well. Uh, the, the results are often a little slower. They're not as instant. Daytime parking is often a very quick quick results can be seen. Nighttime parking problems take a little longer to solve. This may surprise you, but on-street parking management is actually the key to solving your off-street parking management problems as well. The, the, of course, there are other keys, but on-street parking management is absolutely fundamental. Without good on-street parking management, Many of the things you might try to do off-street will, will make very little difference. As we saw in Shenzhen before, private, providing a lot of off-street parking doesn't magically siphon the vehicles away from the streets. 
if there is weakness in the on-street parking management. So um, on-street parking management problems require on-street parking management solutions, but off-street parking, empty off-street parking, actually needs on-street parking management effort. Otherwise, people have no incentive to seek out those off-street parking if they can easily park illegally on the streets, as we see here. This is this means that we often don't know, actually, if we have an off-street supply problem. We don't know if we have an overall shortage unless we've already started to implement reasonably effective on-street parking management. And even if you, you still do need more off-street parking, there are cities where maybe there is a real shortage and uh, no matter how good you are on street parking management, um, you will need more. It is very, very difficult to achieve an improvement in your off-street parking supply unless you also have good on-street parking management. Why? Well, as I said, it's hard to persuade people to use that off-street parking. You can build it, but they won't, they won't use it. Um, the willingness to pay for it, unless people are willing to pay for off-street parking, which they won't unless on-street parking management is effective, unless people are willing to pay um, the financial evaluations of your off-street parking are going to look very, very dismal. Um, you're going to have loss-making off-street parking, which it, it's not wise to have heavily subsidized off-street parking management. You can find out where exactly you need to build your off-street parking management, uh, your off-street parking, getting clues from all of the effort that you've made with your, your on-street parking. Uh, for example, all of those surveys that you do for the on-street parking management. And if your on-street parking management is weak, many cities feel they have no choice but to expand off-street parking. And, and this, is, this is a really significant problem for the sustainability of urban transport. This, this, this creates problems that go far beyond parking because Although many cities, especially cities in middle-income and low-income countries, um, feel the obvious problem they have is a shortage of parking, once you start to implement policies to increase the supply of parking, it doesn't take very long before you have an oversupply of parking. And that oversupply of parking is like a, well, D Donald Shoup has called it a fertility drug for cars, and it's very u easy to overshoot and get tremendous traffic jams as a result of this uh, subsidy for driving, this, this fertility drug for, for cars. And so following the American approach of using minimum parking requirements, where you see here the example of the minimum parking requirements for restaurants, um, in, a, in, a, in an American suburban area you need about double the space for parking is required for, 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 for a particular restaurant. It, it's kind of ludicrous, isn't it? It's, it's ridiculous to require so much parking. But that's the path that many cities are trying to follow, and they feel they have no choice because the on-street situation is so chaotic. They feel, well, we have no choice except to try to get space off-street by building more and more of it and by forcing developers to build more and more of it. In dense mixed-use cities, which most cities around the world are dense and mixed-use, a much wiser course is not to require every single building to have a lot of parking. Much wiser to have parking as a public thing, something that is for the whole district. This graphic from Jeff Tumlin of Nelson Nygaard Consultants shows the difference between requiring parking at every destination and every destination having a sign at its parking lot saying customers only or residents only or tenants only means that even short trips from um, a school to the nearby office to the nearby shopping place etc each of those um, each of those trips is in a car because you're forced to move your car or at least you're encouraged to move your car on the other hand, um, in a park once district, you you will park once and walk around. You, you'll park for that whole district and use that 
use that parking lot as a as a um, a base perhaps to return to your car if you've driven to the area. So older, denser areas um, share share parking. If your city decides that in its is it in its busy di business districts it would like to have travel demand management to reduce traffic congestion, you don't have that choice unless you um, have effective on-street parking management. Nobody is going to uh, agree to restricting parking supply in business districts if they think that's just going to cause chaos in the streets. So this kind of policy which has been successfully done in the business districts of Seoul um, requires effective parking management, which Seoul actually does have in these business districts. Seoul doesn't have very, a uh, very good parking management beyond those business districts, unfortunately. I'm just going to pause for a moment. Uh, I'm back again. Uh, would you believe I had to let the cat out of the room I'm working in? Apologies. Okay, moving on to this framework is a little complex, uh, and I, I won't dwell on it. But if, you, if you're interested, there's a, it's a paper that I wrote um, trying to understand the different varieties of parking policy. And the idea here is that if your on-street parking management is weak, you really probably feel you have no choice but to be in position A, which is where the North American suburban option of requiring every building, it's an on-site emphasis, and you're trying to ensure that parking is plentiful. Um, escaping from that unsustainable kind of an approach requires effective on-street parking management. So now I would like to move on to give you the flavor of some of the sections, some of the more practical sections of the parking toolkit, just to give you a sense of, of what's in there. I won't go into too much detail, but um, the first one is there's a section on deciding where to allow parking, how to do that, what are some of the principles, and what are some of the design principles around on-street parking. Uh, on -street parking. So a fundamental issue here, which is too often forgotten, is that the design of the street actually comes first. So Streets need to be designed based on what is the key function, or what are the key functions, because there's almost always more than one, um, of that street. So if your street is primarily a traffic artery, then you'll make certain decisions about... But if, if your street is a multi-purpose kind of a street, and many of our city streets are multi-purpose, then you need to weigh up a lot of... Uh, conflicting considerations in designing parking. And so these images show you some examples of uh, decisions made weighing up parking uh, options. Parking needs to be consistent with the purposes of the street. And sometimes parking needs to make way for other things. Now, sometimes it's traffic, sometimes it's bicycle lanes, sometimes it's um, space for people to drink coffee. One of the issues that preoccupies people a lot in street design of parking is, should we have parallel parking? Should we have angled parking? Should it be uh, 90 degree perpendicular parking? If traffic is the primary purpose of your street, then you, you're going to want to maximize the street with, in that case, you'll probably have parallel parking or, or you'll, you won't have any parking at all, perhaps. But if you have other if, if your street is, is, um, has plenty of width and is primarily for other purposes besides traffic flow, then angled or 90 degree parking may be good options. And in terms of the space efficiency, both parallel and 90 degree parking are reasonably space efficient. They're, they're, they're pretty similar. A angled parking is a little less space efficient. As I said, traffic is often a key reason to, that cities want to ban parking from certain streets. 
that's such a common impulse, uh, and I, I would agree with it in many, many situations, but perhaps I would just here add a word of caution that don't jump to the conclusion that banning parking in the street will necessarily improve the traffic flow. It doesn't always work that way. Um, it depends on, on the situation. Um, not all on-street parking hinders traffic flow. It depends a lot on the capacity of your intersections. Now certainly you should keep parking away from intersections. How far? Well, it depends on the kind of street. It depends on the kind of road. Um, removing parking from the middle of a block, places that are far from intersections, may not actually do anything for your traffic flow because the limit on traffic is, is much more often the intersections than the middle of middle. So if, if there are shopkeepers pleading with you not to abolish the parking mid-block, um, be careful. Maybe, maybe they're right. Maybe there's no need to abolish that parking. It's very, very important to communicate the parking behavior that you want. So a key part of design is, is the design of the signage and marking. Unfortunately, many countries lack high quality standards. So one of the one of the key things that many countries need to do is establish a reasonably high quality national standard for parking um, signage and marking, and of course for parking design as well. Um, a key thing that undermines enforcement and makes it unpopular is confusing signage. Now, even in the United States, this is a big issue. So it's not just an issue for um, low income or middle income cities. Moving on to enforcement. Enforcement is a fundamental and important part of, of parking, on-street parking management. A key opportunity, but a slightly advanced opportunity, is to digitize that enforcement. But many, many countries are not ready for that, but there's still plenty of things you can do to improve your enforcement. In, in cities and countries with relatively weak um, enforcement capacities currently, probably the first and most urgent thing is to get the institutional foundations improved a little bit. So for example, the ci most cities need the power to enforce. They need it themselves. If the police are the only ones with that power, that's a really big problem for, 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 a cities, for cities to enforce their parking rules. It's, it's, it's very important for the cities to lobby to try to get the power to also have parking wardens, not just the police. The priority when you're establishing your enforcement uh, decisions, the priority should be parking management goals. Now, many cities have other objectives with their parking enforcement. Sometimes it's revenue. And it's very easy to slip into a habit of thinking about the revenue because you, that's something that appears on the budget every year and if it goes down, um, it causes it might cause a problem for the budget, but try very very hard to make parking management priorities the key thing and not revenue. <clears throat> I mentioned digitization and th this is a revolution that's occurring even in middle income countries more and more are starting to do this, but in high income countries this has greatly increased the efficiency of enforcement is using license plate recognition. Um, some places doing it more than others, but it, it, it's a huge opportunity to lower the cost and increase the efficiency and effectiveness of, of enforcement. It's a little controversial, but um, it's very much worth doing. <clears throat> Cities need to experiment in how vigorously they, they um, enforce and how high the fines are set. A common error is to set very, very high fines in the hope of deterring uh, bad behavior, but then having very weak uh, enforcement that hardly ever catches anybody. That's the top, uh, sorry, the, the um, top right in this, in this uh, matrix is, that, but then the fines are seen as unfair and capricious and you'll have very, very unpopular enforcement. And it will be a source of corruption because people will plead with the enforcement officers, please, 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 you know, let me go for a, for a discount. Um, if you have low, low fines and, and weak enforcement, that's obviously awful as well. You'll have just weak, enforce, weak, weak compliance. 
I won't go into this too much more. I just would like to highlight that each city needs to do some trial and error and find the right level of enforcement. And this will vary from place to place within a city. There will be places where you need to have very intensive enforcement, places where, where there's very short-term parking need in, intensive enforcement, places where there's longer durations of parking, the enforcement can be less frequent. So this, this requires a lot of careful planning at the local level. You need some local capacities to do this. Par parking enforcement is unpopular and some cities shy away from doing it because they get a lot of complaints and people complain and write into the letters of the letters to the newspaper editor. But the of having lax enforcement is even worse. There, there will be even more complaints of the chaos in the streets, so that's not the answer. We need to find ways to make enforcement less unpopular and to, to just do it right. There are several tricks and tactics to that. Uh, some of them are to prioritise. So if people believe that you have your priorities right, they're more likely to be uh, friendly towards your enforcement and less complain less. One, one thing is to target those who are habitual violators rather than first-timers. Find ways to be gentle for the first-timers and more harsh on people who are doing violations again and again and again. Make sure that the penalties are proportionate to the kind of uh, mistake. Simple mistakes should not be treated too harshly. It should be possible to appeal because enforcers do make mistakes. The, the enforcement priority should be according to the feelings that are prominent in, in the city. Certain groups like people with visual impairments, the blind people, the elderly people, have certain concerns and enforcement should reflect the concerns of key relevant stakeholders and then those people can be allies in support of your enforcement. Now, now I'll move to the topic of uh, pricing. And, um, so, um, some, someone's got their microphone on. I think it's uh, Rerine. So, someone, can you please turn off your microphone, Rerine Karina? Yeah. Yes. Thanks. Um, please, please mute mute your microphone because we're hearing a lot of noise from from your end. Um, I, I, I just okay. muted it, so no, it should work out. Great, thank you. Okay, great. Um, so, why price? Many people feel that pricing is unfair. It's it's a kind of a an extreme measure, and in some ways, I would have to agree. People find pricing irritating. Nevertheless, in, in on-street parking management, it's such an effective policy that we really have no choice but to use pricing. So I will also give a few tips on how to make it more popular, but let, let's talk first about why pricing. And there are various reasons that cities have for pricing various things, right? Why, why do they price their swimming pools, their um, um, services of various kinds? But when it comes to on-street parking management, many of those other reasons to price, such as cost recovery, uh, such as um, taxation, you know, just, just as a way to get money for the general budget, those, all of those reasons should be secondary. The primary reason is to manage the on-street parking. It's to ration the demand for on-street parking, to make sure that it's not full, essentially. Now, that, there'll still be some revenue, so you, you won't eliminate revenue by making this your priority. In fact, this, this, will, this will give you decent revenue, but don't talk about revenue as the reason you price. The reason you price must be to ration and to, to make sure that on-street parking management is, goals are met. Why is that so crucial? Well, when on-street parking is full, it causes a huge number of problems. So some of those problems are not obvious and some of them are obvious. The obvious ones are the illegal parking and the double parking. You can see that. So if parking is full, then you'll see a lot more illegal parking. You'll see loading and unloading in the traffic lanes. You'll, you may see slow searching and reversing and waiting in the parking lanes. But if parking is almost full, there's an invisible problem, which you may not see, but is also a big problem. It's still a big problem. And so cruising for parking, some, quite a big significant 
proportion of the traffic in busy areas with, with full parking is usually um, people searching around, going round and around for searching for parking. A common figure that's quoted is 30%, but it, it actually depends on uh, the city and it depends on the situation. Pricing can be used in more precise ways to, to encourage more specific parking behaviour changes. But I, I won't go into those details, but just remember the key point is to avoid having full parking. Many cities prefer time limits and if you ask most people in the streets what do you prefer, a time limit or a, a fee for parking, they'll say time limits, it's much fairer than fees, but unfortunately time limits are only really effective in, in some situations. They can be effective but they are not the panacea, they're not really an alternative to pricing in situations with high demand and for parking you really do need to price because the time limits are often ineffective, they just won't achieve the, the uh, prevention of full parking that you need. They require very costly enforcement but you get very little revenue back in return and that they, they just have low compliance, people ignore them or they overstay so it's, it's not really a great option if you have full parking and high demand for parking to just rely on time limits. The older kinds of pricing mechanism are another reason why some cities have been discouraged with pricing and, and these older mechanisms have a lot of problems. They did help, they did achieve a lot of goals but they were not very flexible. It turns out that in the last 10 years or so there's been a huge revolution. Um, there's been a huge revolution in pricing mechanisms and so pricing mechanisms are now very, very flexible and effective and very well integrated with enforcement and the key thing here is digital uh, pricing mechanisms, ideally integrated with license plates so that the license plate number is captured in the, in the pricing mechanism so that it can be easily, easily linked with enforcement. The most common or the most often talked about method of pricing is single space meters or sorry digital meters so smart parking meters but more and more cities are adopting pay by phone or in vehicle meters so m mobile payments, mechanisms of payments that are only mobile and excuse me again I have another cat wanting to come out of this room. <laughs> Uh, my apologies again. So there's a question, um, should developing cities, middle income, low income cities skip the parking meter stage altogether and jump straight to uh, mobile payments only? I, I don't know the answer to that, that it's an open question, it's something that we could discuss but there are some examples already of cities that are doing that, so cities such as Shenzhen in China and Tel Aviv in Israel have now gone to this situation of the only option to pay for on-street parking is with a mobile option uh, or, or often several mobile options to make it friendlier and easier. Another key debate which is very difficult but very important is should you outsource this, this um, issue of um, pricing and in fact a whole bunch of the issues in on-street parking management can be outsourced. Many cities and municipalities in developing countries have limited capacities and limited experience with the more advanced kinds of parking management and they could benefit greatly from uh, getting in companies that have experience with this but a really important issue is that you need to keep enough or you need to build enough internal capacity to actually do the outsourcing in, a, in an effective way. Um, it, it's not it's not enough to just um, simply outsource everything and ignore on-street parking. On-street parking is a 
public sector responsibility and so it needs to be supervised by the city government. So th th there's really no shortcut. You need to build up enough capacity to manage that contracting process and to set appropriate goals for your outsourcing. So this is a difficult issue, but very important. How could we make pricing less politically painful? I'm coming close to the end now of my presentation and then we'll shift to uh, discussion. Well, parking pricing, just like enforcement, it's politically poisonous if you talk too much about the revenue. If people get the idea that this is a tax primarily aimed at raising money, they get very angry and res resentful. The emphasis must be on managing the parking and th this image is a very old set of images from London just to demonstrate that pricing parking is very, very effective at managing the parking. It really makes a big difference. In fact, it's possible to overdo it, just like Shenzhen in China has probably overdone it at the moment with high prices. At a, at a certain point in London's history, they overdid it with high prices and you can see the street was almost empty. But it just demonstrates the power of, of those prices if you can get them about right. So if there is any talk about revenue, and there will be because there is revenue, it should focus on making sure that, that re talking about where that revenue goes and it should go to popular things. And so you can talk about the popular things that that revenue is doing. So this, some various cities have learned this lesson and they make sure that they talk about where the parking revenue is doing excellent things for public transport, for uh, the, the, the sidewalks, the, the pavements, etc., etc., filling potholes, fixing, fixing broken things in the city. In a minute I'll talk about how to set prices and one of the features of this uh, approach that I will talk about is that you only really need high prices in some places, in the really, really busy places. That helps make the political pain a little less. You don't have to have high prices everywhere. Another useful thing is if the prices make a visible difference. Again, Shenzhen has had some success but that there is a visible improvement although they perhaps overdid it. Uh, this image is not the most glamorous image of a, of a street in a, in a city, but it's the same place in Shenzhen before and after the parking management improvements last year. And you can see a dramatic reduction in illegal parking. And when we look at the legal spaces, we see uh, instead of them being all full, they're now um, only partially full. So visible improvements are really important. So as I said, how do we set the price? How should we set the price? Many cities just have a traditional price and they review it every now and then and it, it's very easy to slip into a problem that the price hardly ever changes because politicians are afraid of changing it. Much better to establish a principle and then every year review that price based on the principle. This is politically much more possible uh, because you have the debate just once about that principle. You don't debate each particular price rise, each particular price change, which might be a price reduction or a price rise. And that pr the best principle, many, many cities are finding this, the best principle is to target an occupancy range um, somewhere around 70 to 90 percent. This ensures that you don't get all of those problems with full parking. You avoid the parking search problems, the, the um, illegal parking problems. Modern digital pricing allows you to set this price because modern digital price mechanisms can change their price more easily. You can have different prices for relatively small zones so that you don't have the wrong price in the wrong place. If one zone is quite quiet, you don't need expensive parking. If another zone nearby is very, very busy, you probably do need more expensive parking. If the evenings are quiet but lunchtime is busy, you probably should have a higher price at lunchtime than in the evenings or the evening should be free. So th this provides a principle and so the cities that have so far attempted to do this in the most ambitious way are certain pilot areas in San Francisco and in Los Angeles in the US. Most cities probably should not go to this length yet. That, this is too ambitious, too, 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 um, too difficult. 
probably a better model would be what's done in Seattle at the moment, which is a, a much simpler, low-tech approach to setting prices based on occupancy. With simple zones, this, this map shows you the simple zones, there's only a little bit of time of day pricing, meaning that the price in certain places is different at different times of the day. And they, they are able to incrementally improve this system when they find a problem. So, for example, two years ago they found a problem in Chinatown. The price was too high for the peripheral part of Chinatown, but that same price was actually still too low for the really, really busy core neighborhood of Chinatown. The solution was to split Chinatown into two zones and have different prices in those two zones, and that solved the problem. Calgary in Canada has a similar approach to Seattle with a fairly simple set of zones, but unlike Seattle, they have quite um, intensive time of day pricing, a different price um, on week, uh, in the morning, midday, afternoon, evenings. And they, both Seattle and Calgary are reviewing their prices every year. So sometimes, some places the price goes down, sometimes the price goes up, depending on how busy the parking is. This is in fact very common, and effective parking management in many, many cities does this, but they don't talk about it too much very often. So, um, and that's unfortunate. I wish these parking managers would talk about it a lot more and uh, share their experience of setting prices based on occupancy with other cities. So I'll just end there by just trying to reassure you, and you probably can't read all of this, the text on this slide, it's, there's too much there, but many, many cities have, at least to some extent, been improving their on-street parking management. They, they, they've they made significant improvements in recent years. Places that have had terribly chaotic parking, places like Budapest and Moscow, for example, the parking was, was really, really horrendous chaotic in the streets and they've made dramatic improvements in a short period of time with, with more effective parking management improvements. So that's where I'll end and we'll, we'll shift to the phase of having uh, question and answers. I'll perhaps hand back to Matthias who might uh, facilitate that process. Yes, okay. Uh, many thanks Paul for your presentation. I will quickly take back over the control yeah. and uh, turn on the presentation on uh, my screen again. We'll go with that slide here. Yes. And you will see my screen in a second. Okay. So, so thanks again, Paul. I think this was 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 a really interesting presentation, which has shown us the the, the powers of parking management, and uh, particularly pricing uh, in regulating the demand for parking. And so, uh, for, in the background of of a lot of developing cities, which are currently uh, collecting experiences in, in in parking management and taking action there. Um, the, the, we, we often face the situation that, that uh, national governments have the power to improve the, the institutional frameworks and to improve the legal framework for parking, while of course in the end cities are the ones who, who have to use or have to work with, with the legal circumstances and thus uh, often struggle a bit to, to lobby for the necessary changes. Uh, so um, coming into the discussion, um, I, I invite um, everyone to, to raise questions via the chat function and also if you would like to yeah, uh, give a short intro just to the particular, if you may want to give an introduction to the particular problem in your city, you may also just indicate that you wish to speak via the microphone and I will unmute you. Um, and I would like to begin actually with a question, seeing this, this situation where, where cities need to lobby for institutional changes for parking management. Uh, Paul, can you can you name us some example for a country where where cities gathered together and uh, successfully um, uh, started such or, or pushed the national government for improvements? Hmm, uh, that's a good question, and I wish I had an easy answer. I um, I guess uh, Russia is, is an example where, until recently, the national law um, made it impossible for cities to e 
price on street parking and various of the things that is are absolutely essential for on street parking management were, were illegal under national law in Russia. Um, the Moscow government took a leading role as, as a big mega city. It has a certain amount of uh, power and it's close to the to the to the Kremlin, of course. The Kremlin is there. Uh, so the lobbying by the Moscow mayor and, and the lobbying by the Moscow city government to be given power to have effective parking management uh, probably made a big difference. I'm not sure if other municipalities were part of that effort as well. That would be one fairly recent example. Um, sometimes it's a top-down thing. It was in, in Hungary, I believe, it was actually the national government that, that had a progressive approach about 15 years ago that then established the effective framework for on-street parking management um, in a put it on an effective legal basis in Hungary. But um, probably it would be mega cities in you know, the bigger cities which have the more urgent parking management problems will probably make the difference lobbying their national governments to give them the right powers on parking management. Yeah, that is pretty understandable as uh, in, in, in a lot of countries, of course, the, the, the capital cities are also most uh, suffering. Under, under parking management problems, at least the bigger cities. Mm -hmm. um, we do have another question from, uh, we have a question from Anubra Ilahi, and uh, that goes mm -hmm. a little bit in, in a similar direction, uh, this time to the, to, the, to the field of the local government, the address of the local government. How can we mm -hmm. win local governments to implement parking management without uh, considering the issue of, of generating revenue in, in the first position? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so when, when I said don't talk about revenue when, when you're talking about enforcement or you're talking about pricing of on-street parking management, I said you should emphasize the parking management goals. I, I didn't mean to imply that there is no revenue. Ironically, by focusing on parking management, the local government will actually probably get more revenue. Um, in, in the toolkit, which you will have in a few months. We highlight a case study from the or well, case studies from the United States. In many cities in the United States, Boston is is a classic example. Um, because the on street parking pricing, the on street parking fees have come to be seen as just a tax, and they hardly ever get increased because everybody hates tax increases. So the parking fees in Boston hadn't been raised for 20 years and even when they were raised they were only raised by 25 cents. That kind of change makes no difference to the chaos in the streets. So there's, there's full parking in Boston streets and the parking prices make very little difference. They don't really help manage the parking. If Boston was to shift to a, an approach to pricing that was focused on parking management, the busy parts of Boston would have much more expensive parking. And the less busy parts of Boston might have the same or cheaper than now. But overall, Boston would probably get more revenue from parking. But they would have to emphasize that we're changing the principle for pricing the parking. And we're going to do that once, and then we're never going to debate the actual price again. If there's a debate about pricing of parking, it will be about the principle. How do we set the price? And that principle should be based on parking management, not on how much revenue are we going to raise. If we have the right principle, we don't care about the revenue. But, ironically, having the right principle does give you revenue. And in fact, that revenue is politically an embarrassment because everybody hates governments getting more revenue, right? They, there's a general feeling of, against governments taxing us. So that's why you have to make sure that revenue goes to good things. If there's a surplus from parking, that, that parking money must be spent on pe things that people like. Uh, but, of course, governments need money for all those things that people like, so that, that's not a problem. Indonesia, I think uh, Anugra is from Indonesia. Indonesia is a classic example of this as well. Parking prices are very low in Indonesia. They're the same everywhere. They're they don't vary from place to place. Most of that money goes into the hands of the informal parking um, fee collectors, the, the Jukir, the Juru Parkir in, in Indonesian, and so the city governments get almost no um, revenue from their on-street parking. So Indonesia is a classic case where 
parking management pricing, parking management focused pricing would actually increase the revenue for the governments but would make the politics of on-street parking easier for those local governments if they could manage to get to that point. It's not easy to get to that point but in the long run it would help them a lot. Okay. I see that there's another question waiting. Yeah, so, uh, so thanks Paul for, for, for your answer. I would even add the, the point before coming to the next question uh, that there's of course also a certain role of, of uh, the public, of citizens, of uh, NGOs and of the media. So in, in some cities, in, for example, I know the city in the city of Lviv, there has like quite some public pressure um, with yeah, parking like on every pavement so that you can't walk through and so on. And people were annoyed by this fact and they produced stickers just and, and, and stick them on the cars. Or mm -hmm. they said, I, I, mm -hmm. I'm going to park my fridge on the tram rails to, to demonstrate against the illegal car parking. And uh, that, of course, was then uh, reported by the media and so increased the pressure on local decision makers. So, and yeah, they, okay. they, they put the pressure. Good example. So, Thank you. there is a question from Mirsa Aldi, and I will just quickly turn on the microphone. Um, Mirsa, uh, you are unmuted yourself. No, okay. So, so please. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Hi, Paul. Hi, everyone. Hello. 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 I can hear you. Yep. Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, you, you already visit in Surya Kanchana Bogor, Surya Kanchana Road. You know they uh, they have uh, on street parking, which is the uh, which is uh, spread by four zone. Which is uh, they have uh, high prices and low prices. And currently, the local government uh, tried to improve the uh, pedestrian facility until four meter, which is the impact is to rem uh, they should remove the parking on street, and and then they provide the off street parking in the middle of the uh, sorry 600 meter length. So uh, what what? So I need your uh, point of view because uh, replacing all street parking uh, and as, uh, uh, we assume that they they sh they can move to all street parking with, with no problem with no uh, I don't know I just want to ask you the your point of view to removing all street parking and replace it by the all street parking in the okay. in the sorry Kanchana Road on Bogor thank you Paul. Okay, so some back. Uh, thanks, Aldi. It's, it's it's great to hear your voice. Um, I, I, I helped uh, SUTP a little bit in in Bogor, um, so I'm I'm familiar with that street in Bogor. It's it's a shop for for the, everyone else. It's a shopping street in in a um, in a very busy town in the metropolitan area. It's within the metropolitan area of Jakarta, uh, and. There is not very much off-street parking along that street. There, there, there is a little bit, but um, Indonesian cities often don't have a lot of off-street parking in the old shopping streets. New parts of Indonesian cities have a lot of off-street parking. So this is a particularly old area with shop houses, traditional shop houses. But in order to answer the question in a way that's useful for everyone else, um, my, my suggestion, I guess, would be to do several things. One is proceed gradually, which was also my one of my principles for Palembang, which had a, a similar issue with one of its shopping streets. Right, if parking is on the street, if the the, the the shopkeepers are very worried that if it's removed, it will ruin their business, and, and who knows, they may be right because um, of the particular situation there. So, I would proceed very gradually. So take away a few parking spaces and improve the pedestrian environment at, at a place that's really where, where, where you know the busiest pedestrian section of the street you could do that just maybe remove five or ten parking spaces at the busiest place which in Surya Kanchana is the northern end um, and see what happens right you have to get the parking data do your studies investigate also, in this case, you're, you're worried about the impact on businesses, so you would have to do some um, further studies of how people reach that area 
Do they reach by different modes of transport? And do they do, do, does their situation get worse? And, and this removing parking would be easier also if the on-street parking management was better because uh, excellent on-street parking management is adaptable. So if, if the parking ends up full, then the price can adjust and th there's a few other ways in which it's adaptable. But the, the, key, th the key first point is do it gradually and see what happens. Don't, don't be hasty. Don't remove all of it at once and just hope for the best. The second thing would, would be, I guess, um, do an inventory, a very careful inventory of parking within walking distance of those shops. Um, the inventory should not just count the on-street parking, it should count all of the off-street parking as well, um, including potential parking, but by which I mean some parking which is private, currently it's private and ordinary people can't access it, but if parking was it was in in a shortage situation, so the price goes up, some of that private parking might become public parking. So again, if things are gradual and if prices are allowed to adjust, then you will have some natural adaptation. One problem for Indonesia, and this is a problem in several countries like Vietnam, China as well, is that the off-street parking, the price is controlled by the government in many municipalities, including Bogor. So the off-street parking is currently probably not full a lot of the time, but if we remove on-street parking, it might become full. But those parking managers of the off-street parking can't raise their price in response to having full parking. So they can't adapt. And then there's no signal to other people to invest in parking because it's a loss-making thing. The price is controlled. So there's several problems in Bogor which make it hard for parking to adapt in these older neighborhoods. Um, that's probably enough uh, about that particular thing. Do things gradually, don't control the prices, and um, count, do, uh, get data at every step of the way as you do as you as you do your gradual changes. I hope that helps, Aldi. Yes, thank you. It's helpful. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Paul. Um, I think we, we are a little bit over time already, so and there are also no further questions. So um, I think we should come to an end. And um, anyway, uh, we are available for further questions via email later on. Uh, so just please, uh, one more time, a big thank you to Paul for the really good presentation and the uh, answering of the questions of our audience. And um, so please just allow me to give you some further sources of what I could recommend you to, to, to get further details, further knowledge about uh, parking management. So of course, I recommend you to, to visit uh, Paul's website reinventingparking.org so there's a lot of uh, interesting materials videos for the information that you can find there and uh, as we consider parking as one strategy one tool of uh, the more comprehensive approach of transport and demand management um, also i recommend you to have a look at our technical document um, transport demand management uh, which you can download on, on sutp.org uh, and the link you will directly have also in the presentation. Um, just uh, this is, uh, was one webinar of the SUTP webinar series, and we have a couple of more. In the beginning of June, so either on June 2nd or 4th, we will update you soon. Um, we will have a second webinar on the issue of urban mobility planning, uh, this time with uh, further details on technical recommendations, the more technical parts regarding household surveys, travel surveys, transport models, and so on. Uh, we will inform you about, about uh, this as soon as we have uh, further details. Uh, any further courses, on, uh, courses, training courses, webinar, e-learning offers of different partners, you can always find on capsule.org. And you are also invited to upload own uh, webinar, own e-learning sources there and uh, co connect with this platform, which is uh, open and free to everyone. Um, a few further information about uh, our activities in the field of transport and mobility at GIZ, uh, you can find on this slide. So I mentioned already sgtp.org and capsule.org as main sources, but you can find us also on the GIZ homepage, um, as well as on Facebook and Twitter. And um, we also have some quite extensive photo database on Flickr, uh, all the links you can find on this slide. 
the presentation we will make available soon on, on capsule.org as well. Um, also, we recorded this webinar, so you will have a chance to, to, to watch it again or to share it with interested colleagues. So that video will be soon on, on capsule.org. And in the case uh, you, you have any further questions uh, on today's topic or on, on, on further issues regarding our webinars or our work, uh, just contact uh, Paul or me directly via mail. And uh, so just thank you one more time for joining us today and uh, all the best to everyone. And one more time, thanks to Paul. So goodbye to everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you.